Hello everybody. So here we are then, we're into a look in the dark, chapter 21. This is a short chapter, so I'll get into the next chapter as well. And it's called Laid to Rest. In St. Mary's Greek Orthodox Church in Camberwell New Road, Sue noticed first how grand everything was. Gold and pictures of saints, crosses and bright colours. Her dad thought it was very impressive, but she thought it was already distracting and complicated. Theo's coffin was placed with his head pointing toward the altar. As Sue turned her attention to it, she got very choked up. It was the first time as an adult that she had lost a friend in death, and it had affected her very deeply. Bill Parry handed his daughter a handkerchief, and as he watched her dab her eyes, he felt that this was again his poor little girl looking lost, as she had seemed so often as a child. It struck him that while death can age those who grieve, it can also make them feel as insecure as a five-year-old. There were not many people in the church. Sue's father later said he thought there were about 30. At the front of the church, between two burly prison officers, sat Theo's brother, looking even more lost than Sue. The two detectives sitting behind Sue and her father were very glad that the only known member of Theo's family had been granted a couple of hours of freedom to bid farewell to his law-abiding brother. The prison officers were not expecting any problems. The prisoner was in many ways a pleasant enough man and the governor had not objected in the least to the request for compassionate leave. Rita came and sat by Sue and took hold of her hand, holding it tightly as she fought her own emotions down. She hated funerals but wanted to express her respect for her Greek hero. The priest had come in with Theo carrying a receptacle of incense, the smell of which was as rich as the colours in the church. On the back of his gown of gold and black, he had a picture, presumably, of Jesus. Everyone stood taking their lead from the four Greek businessmen on the other side of the church, who obviously knew what to do. Bill Parry was thinking it was like the meal with Ricky Claymore when he'd watched carefully which utensils to use. Custom must be observed, and especially as a gentleman is laid to rest. The priest began to chant in Greek. His chanting was not unpleasant, but seemed almost too cheery for a funeral. Sue felt the whole world should be stopped for the service, but the sound of a plane overhead carrying many times more than the number of people in the church proved to her that the world was not even noticing. Though the pressmen and women waiting outside the church, in line with Theo's brother's wishes, would make sure that everyone was aware of the funeral in the next morning's papers. The priest indicated everyone should sit, more than once he approached the coffin, leaving his normal position and passing the incense over the coffin's front and side. He made the sign of the cross over his head and his chest several times, and Sue picked out the words Christos, Theos, Alleluia. Each of these more than once in the priestly incantations. These were the only parts of the language that she was able to pick up. At the end of the service, as everyone stood, the priest walked to the end of the coffin and kissed the cross he had placed there. The prison officers allowed their prisoner to kiss the cross too. The burning candles, the incense, chanting and bright colours were all too much for Sue, and she was very glad to get outside in the air. The sound of London filled the air that sunny afternoon, and Sue reflected back on the cheerful chatter of poor Theo, and she felt sadder still that his brave and tragic death was just a weak force against all that continued unchanged around her. The autumn robin singing somewhere was the only sound that seemed suitably melancholy for this occasion. At the graveside, as Theodora Drias was placed in his resting place, Sue put an arm around Rita as her father placed his arm around her. She thought back to those religious education Bible stories of Jesus raising the dead to life, and she longed for such an event right now. Raising her eyes, they met the soft brown eyes of Inspector Hutchins, and he gave her a gentle smile. She hoped his motives for being here with Bennett were pure, and that he had not just come hoping the rest of the Ace Alliance would turn up as well. The Ace Alliance would turn up, all four of them, but not on the day of the funeral. Ricky Claymore had suggested that Sue go to the funeral, but it would be risky for all of them to go. 
Sue was from the area, she knew Theo best, was a beneficiary of his will, and everyone would expect her to be there. He had expressed to certainty that all four of them had a desire to show respect and appreciation for their accomplice who had died at Stanhurst's hand. The evening after the funeral, as the sun was setting and the night was waiting in the wings, slowly claiming space over London, a jaguar pulled up near the graveyard and four smartly dressed people, two women and two men, walked silently to the grave. The two ladies carried flowers which they placed on Theo's resting place, each in thoughtful silence. Both Carol Green and Sue Parry stepped back and held onto Danny Green for support. Then Sir Richard Claymore stepped forward carrying something in his hands. As used as his life had made him to speaking on formal occasions and despite being with close friends, he struggled with his words and the emotions stirring him inside. Theodore Adrios was a rare person, kind, passionate, generous, gracious and a very good friend to the Ace Alliance. He died. The words came out thinly, so Sir Richard repeated them. He died on active service, we might say, after we ourselves had handed our investigation over to the authorities. But for him it might be that a police officer and some innocent people not even involved would have died. Also, the contribution he made to our investigation was invaluable, and a true contribution to the wildlife trade being damaged. The brave acts of this man will not be forgotten, and we can be sure that if there is justice in the universe, our comrade and friend will be blessed by God. Turning to the grave, he placed the object amidst the flowers. It was a clear plastic case. The top of its flat surface was a king of hearts. Beneath it were four aces. Written beneath in beautiful calligraphy, Sue had written the words In loving memory of Theo, a king among men and a true friend to the Ace Alliance. The four friends stood in silence for several minutes and then walked back to the Jaguar, feeling sorrow that was all the better for being shared and expressed together as one. So we'll move on to chapter 22. But first, a sip of coffee. A very sad account, really, of Theo's funeral. So chapter two, 22 is called The Letter. The events of the previous day had brought Hutchins, Bennett and Sue together and Sue had found it unsettling at first but was not too worried afterwards. The two policemen had wanted to see Sue the day before Theo's funeral so they'd taken a trip down the M3 and via Salisbury to visit the lodge house Sue now occupied on the Claymore, Claymore family estate. While Bennett, Hutchins had noticed the thoughtful silence of his sergeant. What deep thoughts are troubling you? Well sir, he paused, checking the mirror as he passed a trio of trucks from three different counties. We have half the Alliance, the Ace Alliance, sorted out. We know about Sue Parry and it's been easy to identify Sir Richard Claymore. An aristocrat is easy to identify. But if we have two of the Ace Alliances, we're not, who, we're not going to be too... Sorry, if two of the Ace Alliances who are not going to be pleased that their cover is blown are known about, they're hardly going to tell us who the other two are, are they? You're right, they won't. Whoever splits on their friends anyway, from schoolboy to big time crook, nobody wants to do that. I remember poor old Harry Bradley having a problem with that. Petty cook, crook he was. Wrong time and wrong place. He knew he'd beaten up an old lady for her handbag because he saw it and he knew Stokely from inside. We knew he knew and he knew that we knew, but it was distasteful to him to testify against another crook, so he didn't. He didn't. No, not at first, but we persuaded him by the end of the week. How, sir? Well, Bradley was good at breaking and entering, but violence was as alien to him as pork is to the chief rabbi. So I took him down to the hospital to see the battered old lady. If a man has any kind of heart, a sight like that poor soul's face is going to move it. When we came out of a ward, he asked me to drive him to the station because he said, I wish to make a statement. 
very good, sir, but we don't have a battered old lady to persuade anyone to die. So where would either Sue Parry or our aristocrat tell us who their friends are? I told you, Bennett. They won't. So with respect, sir, why are you behaving as if they will? Because they will. The inspector was enjoying the trip through Hampshire, Wiltshire and into Dorset. He'd not been this way for a couple of years. Sorry, sir, but you just contradicted yourself. Yes, Bennett, and by now you should be very well used to that. They will not give anything away intentionally, but we will pick something up, turn it over, weigh it up, and in the end they will tell us, so it will be involuntary. He paused to look at a particularly attractive farmhouse. Clues, Sergeant. Clues, that's what we'll get. And as young Sue is just, and our young Sue is just that young, she'll probably give us what we want. Why do I want to know, Bennett? Well, I know I want to know, because curiosity, that's the first thing. Yes, and that's part of what's making you a decent detective, but there's more to it than that. I want to thank them, and even more, we might want them in the future. Do you think we will, sir? What do you think, Bennett? Over the years, I've watched this world change. Pollution, environmental degradation, extinction of the most beautiful animals. None of these were mentioned when I was a boy. We've got four people here who are passionate about this planet and the life living on it. In one short spring and summer, they've helped the environment well earthwide and prevented the greedy doing who knows how much damage. Were they successful, do you think? Yes. Why were they successful? Well, they had knowledge. But they also had very strong emotional feelings. Yes. Passion, Bennett. How many people bother? I think they understood the risks. I haven't got a clue how they got hold of some of the information. Maybe they even broke the law to get some of it. That's passion, you see. They cared. And the day may come when you or I need folk like them to help us. So when we get to Sue Parry's house, sir, what do you intend to do? Test the water. Talk a bit. Look for clues. My old grandmother used to say, it's no good young Royston making a fine table, but leaving sawdust shavings and tools everywhere. No matter how satisfied you are with the job, always tidy up. Then you will know where everything is when you want to use it again. Well, that's exactly what we're doing today, Bennett. Tidying up. When Hutchins and Bennett arrived outside the beautiful gate lodge that Sue Perry had as a rent-free home, there was loud music playing. Hutchins recognised it, the Saint Sans Symphony No. 3 for the organ and orchestra. They stood at the door for a moment waiting for a more gentle point in the music. Sue was in the shower when she heard the loud ring of the doorbell over a less spirited part of the tape Ricky had lent her. He was gradually getting her to listen to classical music and jazz. He was also trying to get through to her sorrow, get her through her sorrow over Theo's death. Sue quickly wrapped herself in a towel and went to the front door. Who is it? she shouted, wishing as she turned the music down because it had wishing she had turned the music down because it had reached a crescendo. Inspector Hutchins hated this. At least there was nobody else about to hear him, him shout, It's the police! Just a minute! Sue raced to the living room, turned off the tape player, grabbed a dressing gown and hurrying to get it on, answered the door with a blonde hair dripping water as she dabbed it with a towel. Sorry, she said, I was in the shower. Can I help you? She was puzzled. Chief Inspector Hutchins and Sergeant Bennett. She gave a quick glance at their ID, but she was a little bit afraid. What if they were friends of Stannis, and not policemen, she thought. Don't worry, love, the inspector said. We only want to ask you a few questions, and we have something for you from Theodora Drius. Can we come in? Yeah, OK. Sorry, I'm just surprised to see you on my doorstep. Hutchins followed her into, into the living room, and they all three sat down, Sue carefully adjusting her dressing gown. The two policemen looked at the pretty girl and were both amazed to think that she'd ever been so involved in all this investigation. They could hardly take in that this young girl, like a schoolgirl, had a place in the Eights Alliance. Sue's alarm was still in her face and she was wishing Ricky was here. Hutchins caught the fear in her and said, There really is nothing to fear, Miss Parry. He gave her his Uncle Royston smile and it had the desired effect, setting her at ease. Nice spot you live in and a beautiful house. Yes, only just moved in. It's mine while I do some work here for the Claymores. Well, you enjoy it, miss. We believe you must be a very special young lady. 
He paused for effect, watching for reaction. Sergeant Benny here has a letter for you. Benny handed the, the, Sue the letter. It's from Mr. Adrias. From Theo? For me? She took the envelope. Poor Theo. Yes, Benny could see that Perry, Sue Parry was hurting. You know he saved my life. He'd be pleased about that. Sue smiled through her pain. He just loved helping people. She started to cry. I'm sorry, I was just so fond of him. Hutchins was moved by the tears. He knew genuine grief. He'd plenty of insincere tears over the years, but real tears upset him. It's okay, Sue. I'm afraid we have to read the letter. We had to read the letter. It's part of our investigation. He was a very brave man. You obviously knew him very well. He had a heart of pure gold. So opened the letter and read it. She could hardly take it in. Theo had cancer? Property for me? Her mind and heart were racing, so poor Theo was dying anyway. I feel a bit better about how he died now. I'd have hated to see him suffering badly, but why has he left property to me? Seems he valued your friendship, Miss, Bennett said kindly. Nice to know he cared about you, eh? Sue smiled at Bennett. I don't know what I'll do with property. You worked for Stanhouse, didn't you? Hutchins asked the question you had the answer to. Yes, I did. I hope you didn't think I was involved in... Well, I mean, I only dealt with his book business. Oh, we know you were involved, so Hutchins paused again. But not in anything bad. We know that you're part of the Ace Alliance. Oh, Inspector, that's ridiculous. Sue coloured up in her cheeks. I'm just an office girl. Not only that, Sue, but we know that Sir Richard Claymore is another member of the Ace Alliance. Hutchins had his glasses off and was playing with them as he spoke. Sue laughed out loud. Oh, come on, I'm just an office worker. And my boss, that is Ricky Claymore, he's just a lovely aristocrat who plays all that down. Calls himself an antique dealer. Yes, dear, Hutchins smiled. And Sergeant Benny here is a Chelsea fan. But is it stop does it stop him from being a cop as well? No. Inspector Hutchins and Sergeant Bennett, we all like to think we can do something worthwhile with our life. And it was if I was part of the Ace Alliance, I would be well pleased. But I'm just an office junior who got a good break and now work for a very kindly employer. Bennett gave a friendly laugh. Ha <laughs> ha, Sue, listen, we know you're one of the four. We're very impressed. You obviously have your head screwed on properly. Sue was bright but red with embarrassment and she wished she could unscrew her, her head and hide it. She was also so perplexed this wasn't supposed to happen. Lowering her head she said, I don't want to say any more. Then don't my dear. Hutchins was enjoying himself. Catching the good guys was even more fun than catching the good, the bad ones. Don't look so guilty Sue, you've done well. And we just want to tell you so, isn't that right Bennett? Yes, we do. Truth is, so we haven't a clue how you did it, but you folk have revealed a web of wickedness and handed arrests to police forces all over the world. It's remarkable. Your parents are very proud of you. Mum, I might have known. I love her, but she can never keep my secrets. Don't be hard on her, Sue. The inspector wanted no family rift. She let it slip, but we already knew anyway. How did you know? Why, well, young lady, I've been a policeman for more years than most people. And I have had to weigh a lot of things up over the years. We knew you worked for Stanhurst. Then you moved. Theodore's letter. I just knew and I think young bright Sergeant Bennett here had a good idea too. I don't know what to say. We all agreed we'd stay anonymous. Very wise of you, Stanhurst. That is, Fuller is a very wicked man. But your secret is safe with us as a secret is safe in your own head. We'll not be telling anyone, nor will we be recording it anywhere. We'll give the press a red herring of some kind. However, we want to tell you that we appreciate the risks you all took. And we'd like to tell you that we would like a contact point in case we can help you again. Sue gave the inspector a sideways look. What does that mean? Perhaps I'd better rephrase that. Maybe someday we might want your help. We have your number, Inspector. Yes. So can we have yours? 
Sue wrote her phone number down. She wished Ricky, Carol or Danny were present. She felt like she was making a deal that she couldn't agree with. However, she knew that a Scotland Yard police inspector could easily have obtained her phone number without any help from her. You're a brave girl, sir. Not every teenager would risk her life for the birds. Oh, don't make me some kind of hero, Inspector. Within the Ace Alliance, there is another lady and she's really brave. She's the one, not me, that's really brave. While I did paperwork, she actually visited Stanner's office on the pretext of wanting books. Did she now? Hutchins gave her a broad grin. Well, I'll not insult you by asking who she is. At least he knew there were two women and two men. Oh, and I won't be telling you either. Oh, can I get you two roving policemen a coffee? As Sue entered the kitchen, Bennett gave his boss an enthusiastic thumbs up. Hutchins knew his sergeant was onto something, but he didn't want to get he did not want to get into talking about it in the earshot of Sue Parry. The moment the police officers left her home, Sue phoned Richard Claymore and asked him to come over. He told her to calm down and not to worry. He said, The trouble with the police is they have to keep at it. He expressed the thought that they couldn't leave it alone and in the meantime some nasty thug was beating up an old lady undetected. As Hutchins negotiated the Dorset country roads, Bennett revealed what he had found. You always tell me, sir, study their books and their photographs. Well, I did. On the coffee table, there's a magazine open at a page about seagulls, and at the top of the page is a picture of the writer. You know, one of those little pictures at the top of the article? His name is Danny Green. He's the man that came to give me all, give you all the information. I know as soon as I saw his face. It does figure that a writer about birds would be in on this, doesn't it? On the wall there's a few, few photos over where I was sitting. One looks like a wedding anniversary picture, certainly a celebration, and there's a woman with Danny Green, looks like his wife. She's hanging on to him and she's got a wedding ring on. Could be his sister, Bennett. There's also a picture of Mrs Green with Sue. If it is Mrs Green, it still proves nothing, does it? On the mantelpiece, sir, there's another photo. This is one not in a frame. Danny Green with the same woman, different hairstyle, but still the same very attractive girl. OK, so it probably is his wife. But can we be sure she's the fourth member? Hutchins slowed the car down and allowed a young man to tear past him and to soon exceed the speed limit. He hated people driving a metre from his back bumper. The photo was one of the Greens standing by a signpost, but I couldn't read it until we stood up. It was an interesting location. It's one of those signs you see as you enter a town or a village, you know, like the one going into your village. Come on, Bennett, I know what you mean. Where was it? Dungannon. Dungannon in Northern Ireland. It's the only one I know of, sir. So what's the significance of the sign as far as you can see, Bennett? Well, Danny Green had a West of England accent, right? Right. He had a real, real Western tang to it. Did we not really know where the two women that were two women involved and that the customs man in Bristol docks was he Cantwell? Yes, James Cantwell. Well, did he not say that the lady who visited him was very pretty and that she spoke with a strong Northern Irish accent? He did, Bennett. Well done. So you think that's why the Greens were in Dungannon visiting family, not just a vacation? I know they say Northern Ireland is very beautiful, beautiful sir, but who do you know that would visit for a holiday with the Troubles? Dungannon is in the news constantly. I think Mrs Green is number four and she visits James Cantwell with the information. Well done, Bennett. I think we have them. I thought his wife was involved when he visited the yard to talk to me. What did you think of young Sue, sir? Well, she seems a very pleasant young lady, brave, cautious, determined and very dedicated to her cause. Yes. You know, if this was the Middle Ages and we had to put her on the rack, I don't think she would have told us who the other members of the Ace Alliance were, sir. Hmm. I could perfectly understand why her mother is so proud of her. Hutchins accelerated out of a bend with a speed that surprised the younger policeman. Hutchins sensed his colleague's feelings. It's OK, Bennett. I'm hurrying because you wanted to finish work at a reasonable hour. They're a strange mix, so. A writer, a girl from Northern Ireland, an aristocrat and a working class London girl. You and however they all got together. Well, Bennett, for now it's enough to know who they are. Also that we know how to get hold of them if ever we feel the need. They took huge risks here and I would certainly seek their help if I felt there was advantages. 
Some may not approve of that, sir, but I think I would do the same. While some of our friends at the yard depend a great deal on formers who have very dubious motives, but the Ace Alliance, they had no doubtful or dubious motives at all. So there it is, the beginning of chapter 22. We're getting toward the end of this marathon. <laughs> Thanks for listening, my friends, and hope you're all well. Beautiful day here. Sadly, we were at a funeral today, but it was a beautiful day and we look forward to better things, don't we? Love and peace to one and all, and thank you again for listening. Bye-bye, my friends. Bye-bye.